go. So, um, for your next project, um, we're going to do a scale composite. So basically, this has to do with um, a lot of the skills that you've already kind of started to develop. And we're just going to apply them a little bit differently now. Okay. Um, so it is another composite. Taking a look at this image, can you guys see that well enough? Or should I turn off the light? I'll turn off the light. He's a genie, right? I'll adjust my camera settings. Take a look at this and tell me what skills the artist or photographer, whatever term you want to use, um, what skills are needed to be able to create this image? What did they have to know how to do? Photoshop. Okay, be specific. They had to know how to do what in Photoshop? How to crop the image and make sure the lighting lines up with both images. Um, cropping, yes. Make sure the what lines up? Lighting. So let's say if, if he was like a little more brighter and the background was a little more dark, he would stand out more? Yes. Okay, so they had to be able to match the exposures in the two images. Okay, so when we say the two images, what are we talking about? The what and the what? The light bulb and uh, one person. Yep. The so there's the image of the light bulb on the table with the background. We're presuming that that's one image. Okay, I don't know this artist. I didn't take this image. And then presumably the second image is the person reading the book with this little like crouched up position, right? <laughs> um, and so the lighting between those images needs to match. Okay, and I'm going to tell you that's probably a little bit Photoshop, but it's also mostly photographing it correctly. Okay, so that's important. Your exposures have to match, and what else about the lighting has to match? What's that thing that we always forget to adjust? White balance. The white balance. Okay, so for example, if the person had very cool light on them and the rest of the scene had very warm light, would it look like they really are together? No. Probably not, right? So you're going to not only have to match your exposures, but you're also going to have to match your color temperature, your white balance. Okay? Other um, things that the artist would have to know in order to create this image. Are you guys with me? How to like photograph themselves or whoever the person is so that they can easily put it in there because like the curve of his back is like kind of perfectly placed on the light bulb. Yes. So posing for this is going to be really, really specific. Okay? And you really have to have um, you have to have your idea visually in mind. Okay, I would even maybe go so far as to say you need to have that background image already taken by the time you go and pose your individual or your subject because, um, yeah, like she's talking about the curvature of his back is really specific. The height of his feet is really specific. So there's specific things that you're going to have to direct your client or your subject to do in order to really have that be believable. Does that make sense? Ladies, are you working on yearbooks? I doubt you're taking notes on what I'm saying. Yeah. Okay, can we put that away for now? Anything else you can see in this one that's specific? When we took the background image for this, or when the artist did, rather, what um, do you think was one of the first settings that they needed to set? What was one of the priorities? Is it shutter speed, aperture, ISO? It was aperture. Why? Because of how much is like in books in the frame. So there's only a very shallow depth of field, a very shallow amount of the depth of the scene, right? That's in focus. Why is that important? Why would that be a different image if that was not the same? Because they're focusing on the light bulb and the person being up close. They're focusing on the light bulb and the person being up close. And what are they specifically not focusing on? What did they blur out? The whole background. The whole oh, background and a little bit of the foreground. Yep. So this is a really, really shallow depth of field. Okay? Um, why is that important to the image? Because it draws your focus there and it makes it easier to like do things more precisely. 
draws your focus there. It makes you um, definitely more aware of the subject. Okay, and the background is there to support it. It may, you know it's the same color temperature. Um, it doesn't distract from it, um, but that way it kind of um, is a way to lead your eye where you need it to be. Okay, it lets you focus on those important details, and it lets the things that are not important be you know very secondary. Does that make sense? Okay, so the idea of this kind of putting two things together that kind of don't belong. Um, relates back to surrealism, okay? And we've talked about surrealism in other classes as well. Um, so this is a, um, a pretty uh, well-known art movement, art period, okay? Oh. And the idea here with, with surrealism is that um, it's not really supposed to make sense. It's supposed to have a very kind of dreamlike, illogical kind of feel to it. Um, this became very popular and well known in the 1920s to the 1960s. So about 100 years ago, okay, a little bit less than that. Uh, but the idea is that it um, uses things like everyday objects in really, really unrealistic and illogical ways. Okay, so if you took intro to drawing and painting and you did the ordinary object painting, um, we talked about surrealism quite a bit. This is the one, you can't see this at all. There we go. Um, this is the one that um, we just did with uh, intro to drawing and painting this year. Okay, so it's the idea of using those objects um, in alternate environments, in you know ways that they don't look normal, okay? But it's painted in a way, right? It's not like real painterly brush strokes where like you can really tell it's a painting. It's painted in a way so that it's supposed to look realistic or as close to realistic um, as you can get. But obviously we know by the subject matter that it's not real. Does that make sense? Okay. So you guys really answered all these questions um, in the last example, right? We missed one thing, because it wasn't really clear in the last example. Um, tell me again how this photographer would have created this image. Tell me step by step what they would have done. Go ahead. They probably would have first set up like the table, like the initial photo, so like the tea thing, mm -hmm. the mug, um, and like set all that stuff up. I don't know about the paper cranes. I don't know if that was like before or after. Okay. Like if that was the first image, second image, or if there were multiples that they did for this. You are correct in that there are more than, I'm assuming, I, again, I don't know this artist, but I'm assuming that there are more than just two for this one. It does relate to a skill you already know from a previous project though, and that would be the tripod layer composite. Yeah. Yep. So see how we're building on these compositing skills? Okay, so you're right. I, I would assume I would approach this as first set up the scene. Okay, in this case, the scene involves the background, the table, the mug, the teapot. Okay, then I would do basically a tripod layer composite and I would hold those cranes in different places. Okay, now the thing that's going to be if you choose to do this, by the way, this is like a little bit more advanced. You do not have to do a tripod layer composite in addition to your scale composite. Okay, the scale composite would be like a person that either looks really big or really small. Okay, we'll, we'll look at other examples of that. Um, but the, the funny or thing that is going to feel weird when you're photographing it is because it's such a shallow depth of field, because it's really focusing on that teapot, but really everything else in front or in back is blurred, is that when you tripod layer composite in all the rest of those cranes, right, when you do these ones up front, they're going to be super blurry. And it's going to feel like, it's blurry, but it really needs to be that way, right? You have to maintain your focus where it's going to be. You have to think about what the final product is going to be. And then you have to photograph each of those individual parts, okay? So for this one, I would say more than any other project, it's really important that you do a thumbnail sketch of what your um, idea is because where things are is really going to matter and it's going to be a lot less adjustable 
after the fact. Does that make sense? Okay? And I know that you all are going to come to me and you're all going to say what everybody says. You're all going to say, my drawing looks really terrible, but this is my idea. Okay? It's fine. Okay? I'm not, like, grading the quality of your stick figures or whatever. Like, stick figures are totally fine. But the idea is that you need to know, okay, I want the teapot to be this big. And I want the person to be this big. And so that way when you're setting up that frame, you can zoom in the appropriate amount or you can move to whatever angle you need because how much of the space they occupy becomes very, very important to your overall effect. Does that make sense? Yes or no? Yes. Okay, good. Um, now, with this person being added in, what did they have to add on the person to make this believable? I shouldn't say on the person, that's misleading. What did they have to add about the person or related to the person using Photoshop? The pose comes as part of like the directing. So I'm assuming they directed um, him sitting on either a chair or like a pile of something so that his feet were lower than his butt, right? So there's that. The pose needs to be directed. Wayne? This is that there's a shadow there? Or... Yes. So because <laughs> the person obviously was not sitting on a teapot in real life, right, we need to, um, as artists, add in the shadow of how it would be if he really was. And that is the key thing that will make it believable or not. Okay, I mean, there's certainly other errors that you can make that would make it not believable, but without that shadow, you can't make it believable. Okay, that's, you, you will instantly recognize, like you'll say, oh, that's Photoshopped, right? And obviously we know it's Photoshopped, but the shadow makes it feel real. more real, exactly. Does that make sense? Okay. And this also I want to just mention, this is another really nice element that you can think about adding, is if you can get that person to somehow believably interact with something in the scene, which is hard also. That's going to relate to your, your thumbnail sketch as well. You're going to have to really plan that out. That's not something that you can just approach the scene and say, oh, well, I'll know it when I see it. No, you won't. you got to plan. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay. Tell me about this one. Took the picture of the house and the trees first, and then? Whatever that is, they took the picture of it. And then the object, which is a camera. camera. So what did they have to really be specific about with the camera in order to make it merge well with the house? Placement and the angle. Placement and the angle. So how big it was in the frame, what angle it was facing. Okay? It's not a person. You don't have to think about posing, but you do have to adjust the placement, which is basically like posing, right? There's just less to pose, less appendages, right? Um, what else helps give this the sense that it is real? The dog. The dog. Yes. Okay? And what probably happened was this was added in like a tripod layer composite, right? And my guess is there was a trainer or somebody, you know, with a treat or whatever to get the dog to look. So even those little details, like where does the dog need to look, need to be planned out. Okay, so that's why having that sketch will definitely help. Um, I would do your sketch not super teeny tiny, but I would do it kind of maybe half sheet size or something like that, just so that things like angles and um, directions are really clear um, to help you be able to photograph more effectively. Okay, now this one's a little bit of an opposite from some of the other examples, right? How is this opposite? Person, person is larger than would realistically happen in the scene. So we don't even see the entire person. Okay, that's fine. Um, what did the photographer have to keep in mind in this scene? Perspective and size difference with the, um, the vanishing point, like how far they're walking away from it, how big they're like. Right. So we see this foot as a lot bigger than this foot because we need to perceive that this one is way farther away down the road. And we know that visually the road appears to get smaller as it goes away because things that are farther away from us <laughs> appear smaller. Okay. So there, that 
difference is exaggerated, okay? Whether that was done in the camera using like a wide angle lens or whether that was done after the fact where they shrunk it in Photoshop, I don't know, but either, either way would be effective, right? Um, tell me about the shadows in this one, though, the shadows that were added. Oops, the, ones below the, feet. the shadows below the feet. On the tree, uh, no. Okay. Shadows on the tree, I'm guessing we're probably there. Think back to when we learned about lighting. What different kinds of light are there? Broad light, short light, hard and soft light. Okay, so when you're making your shadows, you either need to make them as if they were created by hard light or soft light, and from what direction, okay? So what would be the lighting direction and the lighting type in this scene? Is it hard or soft? Hard. It is soft lighting. Soft. Why is that? Because the clouds are there and the light source is the light source is the sun, but we have all these clouds up here that are diffusing and softening that light. Okay? So if we look at the trees, which are presumably part of the original scene, right? They have shadows coming in which direction? The shadows are underneath the branches, right? Because the clouds, when it's really cloudy like this, it makes the whole sky basically one big light source. Like the sun is behind them. Um... It's, I would say the sun is, is probably, it's probably like a middle of the day kind of direction of the sun, okay? Um, so the sun is coming from overhead, but also a large light source overhead, okay? So that means that the shadows underneath are not going to be hard shadows, okay? So you're really going to have to look at the shadows that exist already in that scene to determine what your shadow should look like. Because if you've got soft shadows in your scene, but you paint in a hard shadow, it's not going to look like it belongs there. It's not going to look like it realistically um, is part of the scene. The other thing I want you to see is this shadow here, right? The shadow touches the shoe, which it should because the shoe is touching the ground. Where things touch, there would be a shadow, a pretty sharp shadow right underneath, right? Why is this shadow just very fuzzy? Because it's so far back and the foot's higher up in the air. Because the foot is higher in the air. Okay? Um, I'm trying to, I think it was um, Paige that did one last year. And she uh, photographed herself in this big, like, jumping position. And then she had a picture of, like, a little trampoline. Okay? So it's supposed to look like the trampoline was enormous and she was really, really teeny. And the, the size, the scale comparison was really effective, um, but what she had to figure out was that if she's up off the trampoline, the shadow just becomes like a fuzzy oval, okay? It only gets sharp if the object is touching the ground. So this may or may not apply to whatever scene you choose, but I just want you to be aware. If your object is up off the ground or up off the surface, that does change the appearance of the shadow and the characteristics of that shadow. Does that make sense? Okay, good. Same concept, okay? This one is a little bit more challenging also because they had to not only, I'm guessing, um, tripod layer composite in all the coffee beans, okay? But then also the mug, okay? So they probably had him hold something, like a big white bucket or something like that. That's what I would do if I was photographing this one. If I knew that I wanted him to hold a white mug, I would have him hold a big white bucket or a big, uh, you know, white pillow or something that would just at least approximate it where his hand is so that the shadow where his hand is would be more realistic and I would know what that would look like. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, and then, of course, we had to account, not we, the artist, had to account for um, not only him creating a shadow, but then the cup would create a little bit of a shadow as well. Okay, so you just really, really, really have to think through, that's why we're going to do a, a big thumbnail, um, where all the light would be coming from and how that would be in the actual scene, how that would be affected.
Making sense? Okay. Um, there, I'm guessing, again, not my image, but I'm guessing that there was more about this image that was altered or edited besides just the fact that he was added into this scene. Does anybody know what may have been altered in a, in a slight way? Uh, not the horizon line, although it's definitely not a straight horizon line, is it? And what, because it's off kilter, what effect does that have? He's impacting the scene. It definitely has more impact on the scene. It makes him feel more unstable, gives him a sense of movement. Doesn't make him feel like he's like super rounded, which is what it's suggesting, right? Like he's on the move. Okay, again, this is a guess on my part, but I think that as an artistic director, there were colors here that were added or repeated oh. or embellished to make the scene feel like it, it is more balanced or belongs together. Okay, as the drawing uh, and painting students, we do this all the time. We look for things to repeat in order to make the composition feel balanced. Um, and based on, I think, what he was wearing, since he had... Uh, blue jeans and a bluish cap, right? I think that the blue um, in these buildings was either added or at least enhanced a little bit, maybe made a little bit more saturated, so that it would carry those colors in a repeated way, okay? Because we even see like the sky reflections over here. Um, we see the browns in this side repeated that are very similar to the browns of his jacket, okay? Um, we see blue repeated in a couple different places. So I think that from an art standpoint, I think those were enhanced a little bit. Again, that's going probably a little bit farther than you probably need to. I wouldn't require something like that, but you need to know what your options are as far as making your composition really believable and making it a really strong visual. Does that make sense? Okay. Does the background matter a whole lot in this version, in this composition? It doesn't, okay? So, so far we've been taking really wide photographs. Um, we've been zooming out quite a bit. We've been thinking about the whole scene and our compositional techniques. And that might not be necessary for this particular project. Because it's really more about what is your scene, what is your object that you're going to insert into that scene, okay? Does that make sense? Okay, so your requirements are going to be, um, you're going to either use a person or an object, okay, and you're going to either make them giant or miniature within whatever the environment is that you choose, okay? When I say environment, it could be a wide landscape or it could be, you know, a small portion of a tabletop or a shelf or a counter or something like that, okay? Um, you're going to use your use at least two images to create your composite. All images are going to be taken by you during the course of this assignment. So you're not going to use an image that you took before. You're just going to take new images now because you need to do it with, remember, that composition and all those directions and angles in mind. Um, and then if you are using anything that you find um, as far as like research and stuff, if you're using any of those concepts as inspiration, you have to alter it in some way. So in other words, for example, with this one, if you wanted to use this as inspiration, you could put a different object instead of a little boy on the dog's nose. Or maybe it's a little boy, but maybe it's sitting on something other than a dog. Maybe it's sitting on a rabbit or a lizard or a something else. Does that make sense? So you got to change at least one of those things um, to make it. That is so not what I wanted. Um, to make it your own concept. Okay. Um, Remember that you need to read the lighting and you need to match it between both the object and the environment, okay? So you need to know what that is going in, or you take the environment picture first, and then when you take the object picture in a different location, you have to control your lighting so that it matches or approximates what um, is already there, okay? And if you're doing miniatures, 
So if you're going to make something look really, really tiny, it's really important that you use a shallow depth of field. Okay, because that's how we're used to seeing, that's how humans are used to seeing things that are small with shallow depth of field when it comes to photography. Um, if you think about, there are um, kind of like photography tricks um, and techniques out there now to make like a city or a building look miniature, look like it's like a little, you know, like a little train set could run through it or something like that. Um, and really that effect is achieved by blurring the front distance and the back distance. Um, you know, cell phones even, there's some apps that do that in cell phones now where they're, they're faking that effect just by adding a blur after the fact. They're not truly using like a, a depth of field blur. Um, there's also something, this is like bonus information, there's something called a tilt shift lens where instead of the lens being kind of perpendicular to the camera, the lens has a hinge in it so it actually tilts. So it creates different points of focus uh, different than a, a regular straight lens would. Okay, obviously we're not going to do that. Um, but the point is you got to use a shallow depth of field to really exaggerate that if you want your subject to look miniature. Okay, how do you create a shallow depth of field again? You use your aperture, dial down to as low a number as it can go. Okay, and then also you can exaggerate that by zooming in with your lens. So that might mean you have to back up your feet really far because you're going to zoom in your lens really close. Does that make sense? Questions? Okay, so then you guys are working on finishing your double exposure. Um, I want to see a thumbnail, at least one, with your concept for this, okay, because of time. I'm not going to extend that longer than it has to be. I'm also not giving you a required research assignment um, for this or for double exposure because of time. Normally I would. Normally you'd be finding 20 and you'd be identifying strengths and weaknesses to help you see what's out there. So I still would recommend that you do something like that so that you see some ideas. Um, but I will leave that up to you and what you can fit into your schedule. Okay? No questions? My suggestion to you would be to do your scale composite as something that you can photograph in school because that's going to help you be able to get it done much sooner and then you won't be waiting for some outside of school conditions that may or may not happen, you know, within something that's convenient to your schedule. And then all these, the double exposure, the scale composite, and your updated portfolio then um, for seniors will be due next week Tuesday. So it gives you five days this week. Um, for non-seniors, um, we will have the critiques Tuesday and Wednesday for seniors anyway, so whatever projects you have done at that time. In fact, let's do, let me look at the calendar for non-seniors. How many of you are non-seniors? One, two, that's it. Okay, yeah, I'll have to look at the calendar for how many of you there are. I'll update you. Okay. Does everybody have enough information to get going for today? Yep. yep. Perfect. Do you want to see my